All right. So <clears throat> with this our being our last day of new content, uh, this is also one of those topics that if you're going to be taking stats next, when we get to the new content, it'll make uh, a little bit of that transition better. Um, if you're going to be taking pre-calc next, uh, it's unlikely you're going to see the new content when we get there again. Um, there's a little bit that's applicable towards a pre-calc view of things. So just as you're thinking, do you keep this in short-term storage or long-term storage? Depends on what you're taking after this. But before we do that, some quick review questions. So this is composite functions that we started doing. Feels like a long time ago, but it was probably only a week ago. All right. So notation right here. Ooh, my thing isn't showing up. Hold on. All right. Notation. That open dot in between, we read as the word of f of g of x. Just like up here, this is f of x, that's g of x, that's h of x. This is f of g of x. So I could rewrite it. If you don't recall, it means f of g of x. So f of g of x means you're going to take that, whatever the g of x function is, there's the g of x function, and we plug it in to the f of x function wherever there's an x. So why don't you take a little bit of time, see if you can plug this in to make my single equation. So all we're doing at this point, when it just says like this, find f of g of x, is we're just going to simplify it into an equation. Down here, if it's f of g of 4, well then whatever equation I end up with here, I'll then replace the x with the 4. So you'll do that second. And then third, there's doing it then for practice on your, you know, giving it another try, but a little bit more complicated, f of h of 9. You would normally start with f of h of x, find that equation, and then plug 9 in for the x and simplify from there. Um, but for right now, see if you can figure this out. And note, you were not assigned cards today, so just go ahead and whoever you're sitting next to talk if you don't know where to start. If you're not sitting next to anybody, then use your radar ears to listen in on what other people are talking about. But start with this, and then go to this one. And if you're feeling confident, try to hit the third one. So again, f of g of x means instead of f of x, like this says up here, that's f of x, 5x squared plus 2x. Instead of the x, I'm going to replace the x with whatever this is. Well, that, that's g of x. So to do that in this equation means I take the equation. The f of x function is f times something squared plus 2 times the something. And that something... Instead of x, because the equation was f of x, I'm going to replace the x with the g of x function. And the g of x function is square root of x. So instead of this being an x, I'm now going to have right there the square root of x, and it will be the square root of x squared times 2, or sorry, plus 2, times the square root of x. Then to simplify, parentheses, exponents, exponents. So i got to do the exponents first. Square root of x squared. They're inverse operations. That will be x. So I'll have 5x plus 2 times the square root of x. So I did parentheses, exponents. There's no more multiply, divide, add, subtract. Well, add, subtract, the question would be, can I add these two things? Do they have the exact same variable? No. no. That's a root x, that's an x. So they cannot combine. So at that point, that is f of g of x. It's done.
to do f of g of 4, I take the f of g of x function, 5x plus 2 root x. And wherever there's an x, I replace it with the 4. So it'll be 5 times 4 plus 2 times the square root of 4. Order of operations, parentheses, exponents, roots, permdos. That's why I threw the R in there when we did permdos a long time ago and people said, where'd the, what, R? P, E, R, M, D, A, S. After exponents, then you do roots. So I'll have five times four plus two times two. Right here, this would be square root. No. Oh, right here, no. Because, that's a good question. Up here when I had the f of x function, when I swapped the g of x into it, I had the square root of x squared, square root of x squared. So now my f of g of x function is 5x, no longer 5x squared. The squared and the square root are inverse operations, so they essentially cancel. I don't like that word, but that's a familiar term for a lot of people. <laughs> Leaving me with just 5x. So when I'm putting in 4, it just goes, so it's now just 5x, not 5x squared anymore. Right. So then I'll have 5 times. So then, as I went down my parentheses, exponents, roots, now I'll do my multiplying. 20 plus 4, which is... 24. Right. f of h of 9. I'm going to start with the f of h. f of h of x means, and again, I can rewrite it if it helps you think about it that way. If you end up going to pre-calc next, you're going to see this notation Probably not this notation. All right. So f of h of 9 is really f of h of x. And then at the end, I'll put the 9 in. So I'm going to start with this. I'm going to take the f of x function, which is 5 times something squared plus 2 times that same something. And the something will be the h of x function. So I go up here and say, well, h of x is x minus 1. So this is x minus 1. Move that up just a little bit so we have some room. Now I simplify. 5 times, well, if I wanted to, I can do, I'd have to do x minus 1 times x minus 1 plus 2 times x minus 1. At this point, because that's going to be a lot of multiplying out and things like that, at this point, it would probably be easier to now go ahead and replace the x with what we said it was going to be, which is 9. So now we go down to this function, and I replace each of the x's with 9. 5 times 9 minus 1. 9 minus 1, plus 2 times 9 minus 1. Right. 9 minus 1 is 8. So then I'll have 8 times 8, which is 64, 
64 times 5, 320. So this simplifies to 320. All right, the 9 minus 1 over there is an 8. 2 times 8 is 16. So my final answer for what, oh, up here. What f of h of 9 is equal to is 336, because that was the 320 plus 16. So for these, f of x is this. This is notation for that little negative 1 there. That means inverse. So we want to find the inverse function of f. Do you remember how to do that? Start with writing it this way. No, not m. 3x minus 7. Where this is the same as this. But instead of writing it as f of x, I'm writing it as y. To find the inverse, wherever there was a y, we make it an x. Wherever there was an x, we make it a y. Then solve it for y. Added the 7 to both sides. Divide by 3. Same as multiplying by a third, however you do it. So x thirds plus 7 thirds equals y. And then I can rewrite it as function notation. The inverse function of x is x thirds plus 7 thirds. <clears throat> Just the process of finding the inverse function. Question is, do you have to do it as individual things, or could I have just rewritten this as x plus 7 all over 3? Those are the same thing. Uh, not prime. F to the negative 1. Sorry about that. Getting back to my calculus notation. Very different things. So f to the negative 1 is the inverse function of f. So x plus 7 over 3 is the same as this, right? Because they're the same denominators, I could combine them, x plus 7 all over 3, or I can have them separated out. Either one would be acceptable. Yeah. If you're working towards pre-calc next, this will be likely your desired option because there will be some other things you'll be doing after that point of finding an inverse function. And then f of inverse of f of x. If you do this, every single time you take a function and its inverse, it will always be x. The composite f of inverse of f of x. Right, these are the same thing. This is one way to write it. This is another way to write it. Always equals x. Homework type questions, and, or I should say check your understanding type questions, would say something like, are these two functions inverses? You could either do this process and go, tut, 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 tut. oh, yep, it gave the exact same equation they give. And you'd say, yes, they're inverse functions based on this work. Or you could do this. Take one of the functions, put it into the other function, and if you simplify it out and it just becomes x, then yes, they are inverse functions.
inverse functions, if you graph them, are reflections over the line y equals x. That's why when you take them and put them together and it equals x, it's a reflection over the line y equals x. All right, so now new content. Now that we're done with the review. So new content is this idea. This is what we're going to start with. So take a couple moments, minutes if you will, and with the people you're sitting next to, talk about how would you find out in a room of, well, at first, it's, so the first question is in a room of three people, how many different groups of two are there? So for three people. Then say, well, in a room of four people, how many different groups of two are there? In a group of five people, how many groups of two are there? Uh, see if you can figure that out and see if you can start seeing a pattern. If you do, then do six and seven, <clears throat> but only if you see a pattern. Don't try to grunt work these out. They, they become a little bit more complicated. All right, so take a minute. Start figuring out how you would do that in a room of three people, how many groups of two are there. You can probably write that down and figure it out. Four people, you can write that out. Five people gets to be a lot more writing, but give that a try, and then we'll come back in a minute. What number do people get for three? Three. Anybody get a different number than that? Okay. How many groups of four? When are how many groups of two when there are four people in the room? I have five and a six. Six seems to be more the consensus. I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm just gonna go with what you guys are thinking. All right. Five people. Ten. Maybe getting a number different than 10? Okay. I don't know how you guys solve that one. One, two, three, four. If I have five people, I would have done something like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I only did five, six, and seven because this one already existed. So I didn't need to add another line there because they are already from the first one. So seven, and then from this person, eight, nine, and then 10. Is there, or do you see a pattern from three to six to 10? I see some heads shaking, and I see one nod. What pattern do you see? There's four people who go up by three, five who go up by four, and there's six who go up by five. So you think you go up by five? So how many would this be then? I go up by one less than those people. So what would your guess be for number for six people? Uh, Fifteen. Because he's saying this is going up by three, this is going up by four, so his guess is this would go up by five. All right, and again, we could, if I erase this over here. I kinda, uh, uh, like a penta. Yeah, it did. That's because it's a five-sided figure. Penta is five. So if I do six, one, two, three, four, five, six hexagon and then start counting one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen and then the last one, 15. So it's going up by one. So then what would seven be? 21, because you're going up by six. All right. And if I said there, what if there are N people in the room? Well, 
Well, that becomes a little bit harder. But this is an idea. It's one of the counting principles that's part of probability. But we'll come back to a general formula on this in a second because the next one is, what if we do it this way? How many ways can people finish in first, second, and third in a race if there are three people in the race? Then what if there's four people in a race and five people in a race? And then, if, again, if you see the pattern, jump up and find eight people in a race. So take a minute, work this out yourselves and with the people sitting next to you. How would you work that one? All right, because it's different than the last problem. The last problem just says a group of two. Now, finishing in a race first, second, and third, now the order, that's different. That's, that's important now. So take a moment, figure these out, talk with people next to you, and we'll come back in a minute. So instead of just giving an answer for three people, tell us how, because there's a couple different ways you could go about working through this. What's one method someone used? Okay. Um, Give them a number, one, two, and three. Can I, how about I do this? Can I do ABC? Yeah. Okay, because that way we're not getting confused with one, two, three, and yeah. So that would be one way to finish. What's the second way to finish? Then what did you do after that? BAC? BCA? Okay, this top one could also be ACB. So trying to find a system like ABC, then ACB, BAC, BCA, CAB, CBA. For a grand total of six ways. Another way you could think about it would be if I, how many, if this is first place finisher, A could finish first. B could finish first, or C could finish first. And then second place, there's only going to be two branches, because off of A, if A finished first, then it's going to be B or C. If B finished first, it'll be A or C. If C finished first, it'll be A or B next. <clears throat> and then, if A finished first and B finished second, that means C finished third. Again, listing three different ways, or sorry, six different ways that that can happen. Okay. A third way, you can say, well, here's my first place finisher. How many different people can finish first place? Three. Here's my second place finisher. If I know that I have a first place finisher, how many people can finish second? Two. A third place finisher, how many people can finish third if I have a first and a second? One. Three times two times one. That ends up being the fastest way than trying to list them all out. Because if you listed them all out, once you get to four, it, it's a big mess. I mean, it's doable, but it's kind of messy. <clears throat> What was, did anybody get the number for four? You got 24? Four times three times two. Because there's four different people that could finish in first place. And again, if I wanted to do it more like a, a the tree diagram like we had down here, I would have to add D, which means each of these gets added because then there's three options after that. And then after this, there's going to be two options. Or 
or you could use this method and you just need to be really careful with how you keep track of who's where and what for first, second, and third. All right, A, B, C, A, B, D. So this is six, that's 24. What was five? Or can you figure it out now, I should say, now that we have this process? 60, five times four times three. If we were trying to look for patterns, six to 24 to 60 is like, what is going on? And then eight, because eight's typical, right? If you, if you run track, you have an eight lane track. I mean, you might have a nine if you're running just a hundred. Some, some tracks have 10 for the hundred, <coughs> but a typical track is eight lanes. So you have eight runners. How many different ways can they finish first through eighth place? Well, first, second, and third, I should say in an eight person race. Eight times seven times six. What is it? 336. It's a lot of different ways that eight people can finish for just for a second and third. But the order is important. All right. The last slide that we worked on, it didn't matter. It was just a group of two. We could do groups of three, groups of four, where the order doesn't matter. Here, order is important. The two ideas that we're getting at come from, well, we'll start with one of them, Pascal's Triangle. You may have seen this in your distant past if you had an elementary or middle school math teacher who really likes math. Pascal's triangle was, well, Pascal came up with this idea. If I have ones down this side and ones down this side, if I take these two ones and add them together, it gives me the two that's in between it. So now my next row is one, two, one. And then the next row, these are all going to be repeat ones. The next number over is the sum of the two numbers above it. Two plus one, that's three. Here, two plus one gives me three. And then I get the one running the other side. Then over here, one, four, six, four, one, all come from the four is the sum of the one and the three. The six is the sum of the three and the three. This is the sum of the one and the four, or the one and the three gives me four. So you can see how these numbers just keep generating. And I could keep going down, down. The 20 is the 10 plus the 10. 10 plus the five is the 15. Five and the one is the six. So what this would be is, <clears throat> let's say I take this row right here. I am in the third row down, fourth row down, sorry, right, because then I have zero, one, two, three, four, yep. Yeah. This would be considered the fourth row. And if I wanted to know how many groups, so if I have four And I wanted to do how many groups of one can I have if I have four people, four groups of one. There's four of them. If I have four people in a room, how many groups of two can I have? Six. There are six groups of two. So this was one, this was two. How many groups of, if I have four people in a room, how many groups of three can I have? There's four different ways. If I have a group of four in a room, how many groups of four can I have? Well, there's only one way. So this would be, there's one way to have zero people. There's four ways to have one person in a group. There's six ways to have two people in a group. There's four ways to have three people in a group. And there's only one way to have four people in a group. If I'm in a, so I think guess this is getting back to what that couple slides ago was. If I have five people in a room and I wanted to have a group of two, Zero, one, two. We did this. It was 10. There were 10 ways to have groups of two if I have five people in a room. 
We did the six. We found that number was 15. It was these numbers right here for groups of two. This is what's called a combination. In a combination, one of the ways of writing it as shorthand notation is NCR, where N is the number of people total, and R is my group size. R is the group size. So this number here that we had, that 15, would have been, well, if I have six people in a room and I want groups of two. That number is 15. If, again, if you're taking stats next, this would be part of what you're going to do when you get to a probability unit in statistics. You're going to be doing something like this. Depending on who you have teaching your class, it can also be rewritten like this. Six two inside parentheses like that, no fraction bar, no anything. To mathematicians, they look at this and they go, oh, that's a combination. Six groups or six people, groups of two. All right, so that's how they would write that. All right, and these Again, these are called combinations. How many different combinations of two people can I have in a room full of six? Fifteen. One, two, three, four. This is the same number. So if I have six people in a room, how many groups of four can I have? Also 15. I mean, you see the symmetry in this entire triangle. That's what's going on. These are also called binomials. And that may have been where you had a teacher present this to you, possibly in like an Algebra 2 class. Um, if I have... Another application here, uh, x plus 1 squared would be 1x squared plus 2x plus 1. If I had x plus 1 cubed, I would have 1x cubed, 3x squared, 3x, and 1. If I'd have x, and I could do it the other way around. What if it was x plus y to the fourth power? It would be 1x cubed, 4x squared y, 4x, or sorry, 6x squared. This was, q, uh, sorry, fourth power. Sorry about that. Losing track. Change my powers here. x to the fourth, x cubed y x squared, y squared, those are squareds, x, y cubed, and then y to the fourth. So it's called a binomial expansion with combinations. So Pascal's triangle, we find, actually has a lot of applications as we go through this. So that is the actual formula on the left-hand side for a combination. Like, what is NCR? So if we do this with the one that we just showed, 6 combination 2, I would write that as 6 factorial. The exclamation point means factorial. I'll explain what that means in a minute if you've never seen it before. The R is the 2, so it's 2 factorial times 6 minus 2 factorial. Factorial means 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. In the denominator, I'm going to have 2 times 1. That's the 2 factorial. Times, let's see, so 6 minus 2, that's 4. So 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Where this part, 4, 3, 2, 1, that was a 6 minus 2. 
factorial. Some calculators have functions that will do this. If it's just going to be on the exam, it's not going to be big numbers. So you could do it by hand. Write it out like this. Don't put all these numbers in your calculator. You get to here and you go, the 1's reduced, the 2's reduced, the 3's reduced, the 4's reduce, And 2 goes into 6 three times. And we know that that number, because we already did it once, is 15. Because 3 times 5 is 15. And we divide by 1. A combination will always be a whole number as well. So if you forget to reduce something, all of a sudden you're like, I got 15.5. You did something wrong. Because you cannot have 15 and a half groups of two. Permutation, this is where order matters. If we have a race, eight people in a race, I want to find out how many ways they can finish in first, second, and third. Eight factorial divided by eight minus three factorial, which is eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. In the denominator, eight minus three in parentheses is five. So I'd have five factorial, which is five times four times three times two times one. The ones reduced, the twos reduced, the threes, fours, and fives, and I'm left with eight times seven times six. Way more manageable to do in your calculator than trying to do all the numerator and all the denominator at the same time. All right, six, six choose two is 15. Take a second and find six permutation two. All right, give that a try right now. What's the final answer going to be? Everybody get it yet? Six factorial over six minus two factorial. Six factorial is six times five times four times three times two times one. Inside parentheses, 6 minus 2 is 4. All right, so it'll be 4 factorial, which 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Reduce, 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 30. So if I have 6 people in a room, there are 15 different groups of 2. If I have six people in a race, there are 30 ways for them to finish first and second place. Well, there's also 30 ways for them to finish in fifth and sixth place. Order is important. Order is not important. Which is interesting because what is that? A lock. Anybody have those on your lockers at school when you're in high school? Maybe you're, do you have a lockers in a gym? Like, do they have over here a locker room and you put a lock on your locker? And then how do you open this? How do you open this thing up? 
What do you put into it? Three numbers. In a in an order that matters, right? It's a very specific order. What would you typically call this? These three numbers. It's your locker combination. This is where the English language has failed you. Because the order does matter. If you put them in in any order, didn't matter the order, you're not going to get this thing open. Because a combination is three numbers where the order doesn't matter. What you really should do, and I've tried to do this in my past, back when I worked in schools, tell them, oh, here is your locker permutation. And they all look at me with this blank stare going, my what? Explain it to them, locker permutation. That's what we're going to call it. It's your locker permutation. It's not a locker combination. I've tried to set a trend. It's not working. I apparently am not an influencer of any kind. But it's a locker permutation. Because if you do it out of order, your locker will not open. How many numbers do we have to choose from? Thirty-nine, because we had thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine. So there are thirty-nine possible options, and yours is three. So if you have a locker, and you have a lock, and you find out that yours is the same as someone else's, you're like, "Wow, what are the odds of that?" Well, here's how you'd find out. This is thirty-nine factorial over 39 minus three factorial. I'm not gonna write all this out, but I end up with this, 39 times 38 times 37 times 36, and 36 all the way down, this is 36 factorial, all right? Because 36 factorial is 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, etc. In the denominator, 39 minus three is 36, Outside the parentheses, factorial. Oh, look at that. I can just... Geez. Those three numbers multiplied, which is... There are 54,834 different ways that you could open this up. But that also assumes that your locker permutation could be 0, 0, zero, which I don't know if they program that into these or not. I don't know if there's certain combos that they don't have. I shouldn't say combos, permus. So if you find out yours is the exact same as someone else's, well, there's only one way that can happen out of 54,834. Because the order is important. The binomial theorem is then an application that uses combinations. So I'll write the formula first. NCR times P to the R times 1 minus P to the N minus R. All right. So N and R. N is the number of whatever things I have. R is my desired number of outcomes that I'm looking for. P, lowercase p, is the probability of success. 1 minus p, which in some books is called q, is the probability of failure. Because in a binomial, by two, there's only two possible outcomes, success and failure. We'll look at a couple of examples of what that might look like. We'll use this formula a couple of times. You go, okay, I see. We're just, basically, we're just plugging numbers in once we identify that, oh, this is a binomial situation. The probability of one heads in five flips. So first off, 
if you had to guess, what would you guess is the probability of getting one heads if you flipped a coin five times? Because probability is always somewhere between 0 and 100%. So it's between 0 and 1 as a decimal. But what's the likelihood of flipping a coin five times and getting exactly one heads? Well, it's 50-50 on any one flip. But this is five flips. So you could think of it like this. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it would go down. Yeah. It, it's going to go down every flip. Yep. All right. Well, first let's go. Well, how many different ways can I flip a coin five times and have exactly one head? Now, it doesn't matter where the heads comes up. I've just flipped a coin, or, or think of it this way. What if I flip five coins at the same time. This is what we're thinking of. I'm flipping five coins at the same time, flip all five, I'm looking, and there's only one heads. There's only one way that that's gonna happen. All right, but what this is, is this is a binomial because there are exactly two outcomes, heads and tails, success and failure. Uh, flipping a coin, every time you flip a coin, the results of one coin flip does not impact another, the second coin flip. That's called independence. I have a set number of trials. So what I'm really asking for is what's the likelihood that heads equals one? All right. And the formula for the binomial is probability that X equals R. And the equation, I'll rewrite the equation and then we'll substitute values in, was... NCR times P to the R times 1 minus P to the N minus R. So this will be how many N's, how many total things. There's five flips. R is my desired number of outcomes. How many outcomes do I want? One. One times probability of success, what's the likelihood of getting a, a heads? Heads, flip a coin. 50-50, one half. How many heads do I want? One. Over here, I'm going to have one minus one half. And then N is 5, R is 1, so 5 minus 1 is 4. And the other way to think about this is how many ways do I want heads? 1. How many tails do I want? 4. This was success, heads. This was failure, 4. That's tails. And then I go, all right, formula for NCR is 5 factorial over 5 minus 1 factorial times 1 factorial. Well, 5 minus 1 is 4. So this is actually 5. There are five ways that it can happen. times one half, because one half to the first power is one half, times one half to the fourth power. And now you can probably take out your calculators and do one half, which is 0.5, to the fourth power, times a half, so times 0.5, and then multiply that by five. which means there is a 15.625% chance that if you flip five, if you flip a coin five times, that you're gonna get exactly one head.
look at another example. Oh, we're going to talk about it a different way, and then we'll come into it in a second. All right. Uh, if you flipped a coin 10 times, on average, how many heads would you expect to see? On average, five. So expected value in this case would be five. How did you find that? Even split. So if I have 10 coins, the probability of a heads is one half. So it's N times P. All right. So with that in mind, if you roll a die, singular of dice, right? If you have more than one die, you have dice. So you're going to roll one die. How many sides on a die? Six. Whenever I talk about a die, I'm talking about the standard die, just a six-sided die. If you rolled, so if you roll a die 12 times, on average, so think about this. Don't answer out loud. If I roll a die 12 times, on average, how many threes would I expect to see? Well, how many threes are on a die? There's only one. So again, if you're not familiar with a die, it's a cube. Got little dots on the sides. All right, so if this is two, right, on the bottom of that die would be five. If this is one, on the back side of the die, that's a six. If this is three, on the side opposite of it is a four. I don't know if you've ever noticed that about a die, but the opposite sides of a die add to seven. A standard die, opposite sides add to seven. So if this is a one, the back side's a six. If the top is a two, bottom side's a five. But anyways, a three only is on there one time. So if on average, if I roll a die 12 times, Twelve times, what's the likelihood of rolling a three? How many threes are there? One. How many sides are there? Six. I would expect to see, on average, two threes. Now, is it possible to roll a die twelve times and not see any threes? Absolutely. So what do we think the probability of getting five heads is on 10 flips? If we expect to see five, what's the probability of getting five? It's a binomial. Number of heads equals five. 10 choose five times probability of success, one half. I want there to be five of them. Probability of failure, one minus a half to the fifth power. 10 choose 5 is 10 factorial over 5 factorial times 10 minus 5 factorial. I'm just going to do that number first. So this is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 factorial. There's a reason why I stopped there. Because in the denominator... I have 5 factorial times, this is 10 minus 5, which is also 5 factorial. I'll write that one out. 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. This 5 factorial and that 5 factorial are going to reduce. And then I'm going to start doing some more reducing. This 5 goes into that 10 twice. This 4 goes into that 8 twice. This three goes into that six twice. This two will factor out, we'll take that two out of it. So then in the numerator, I'm left with two times nine times two times seven. A lot easier to do that than all of those other calculations. 
So nine times seven is 63. Two times two is four. So there are 252 different ways in 10 flips of a coin to get exactly five. So this will be equal to 252 times one half to the fifth times, what's one minus a half? It's also one half, so it's times a half to the fifth times a half to the fifth, which is one half to the tenth power times 252. This equals, if you do that in your calculator, 0. 0.2461, I rounded, which is 24.61% chance. So while in a flip of 10 coins, we would expect to see, on average, five heads, what's the likelihood of flipping 10 coins and getting exactly five heads? 24.61%. And you'll actually find that this is then the highest probability. If you did all of the probabilities, that's the highest one. What's the probability of getting two threes if you roll a die 12 times? So just like we did the last two, I want you to take a second and do this one on your own or with the people sitting next to you. And I'll flip it back to the other screen that has the work on it so you can model it after the other work. But write this down so you remember, rolling a die 12 times, what's the likelihood of getting exactly two threes? So 12 times, we want two of them. And then you have to remember what the probability is of getting a three. What's the probability of getting a three? One in six. So what's the probability of not getting a three? Five and six. So this is P. This is, I said, sometimes called Q. Probability of success, probability of failure. So I'll kind of walk us through this. Again, ideally, you're working through this and trying this on your own. N is the total number of trials, 12. 12 rolls of the die. Combination, two, that's my desired number of outcomes. I want there to be two threes. When I write it as a variable, I don't recommend you write e three equals two because that would actually be not correct math. So I'm threes, that's my success times success probability is one-sixth and I want two of them so it'll be one-sixth squared times Q Q is the likelihood that it's not a three so the probability of failure is one-fifth and I want ten of those if there's two successes there's ten failures And then 12 factorial over 2 factorial times 12 minus 2 factorial. This will be 12 times 11 times 10 factorial. And the only reason I wrote like this, I don't want to write 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. And the reason why I don't is because this parenthesis, 12 minus 2, is 10 factorial. So that's why they're going to reduce nice and easy for us. Dirt, dirt. 2 factorial is 2 times 1, which is 2. 2 goes into 12 6 times. There are 66 ways. If I roll a die 12 times, there are 66 different ways that I can have exactly 
two threes. And then I go to my calculator. I'm going to have to do 66 times, and now I find one sixth, raise that to the second power, find five sixths, raise that to the tenth power, and then multiply. Five divided by six is 0.83 repeating, raised to the tenth power times, parentheses, 1 divided by 6, raised to, wait, squared, right? Yeah. Times. Times 66. I did something wrong on my calculator. Someone got a better calculator than my phone. What'd you get for a number? Anybody? Did you get an answer for this? Yeah. What'd you get? Point two nine six. That could be about right. Which is twenty nine point six percent. Seems a little high. But, <clears throat> again, uh, so that is right. So there's a 29.6% chance, almost a 30% chance, that if I roll a die 12 times, that I will see the three happen exactly two times. So, again, as these combination permutation are not... Uh, I'm not, there's not check your understanding problems to work on out of the book. What you should be doing is looking at these scenarios between rolling a die basically and flipping a coin will be most of the options. I mean, there's also things like uh, the likelihood of giving birth to a son versus a daughter. Um, they're not 50 50, by the way. Uh, there's actually, and there's no way to have an actual theoretical, like this is our theoretical probability for rolling a three, because we know there's exactly six sides and it's gonna come out one hour. There is not a theoretical probability for giving birth to a son and a daughter. For some reason, population numbers have always been that there are more women than men. All right, not by a lot. You know, it's like women are like 50.9% and men are 49.1%. So there's, there's just fewer men out there for women. But that's kind of, I mean, by a small amount. So it'd be like, what's the likely? So my mom, she had four boys. So you said, what's the probability that all four of them are also the less likely thing to happen? Slightly less. All right. So you can figure out probabilities along those lines. All right. And then the last idea is this. More a matter of just getting you to stretch your minds. This will not be an exam question. But it gets you to start thinking about, this is a very famous problem that's out there that people typically get wrong when they think about it. But the idea is this. Um, in a room of N people, what is the likelihood at least two people have the same birthday. Okay. And when we talk about N people in a room, we're talking about they're, they're randomly picked. It's not like taking your friends who you know their birthday to putting them in a room and say, well, I know their birthday, so I know there's at least two of us. But this is like, what if there are 20 people in a room. What do you think is the likelihood that at least two people have the same birthday? How likely do you think that is? What's your instinct say? Just your instinct. Ballpark, guess me some numbers. I'm not done yet. 
you say less than 1%? Less than 1%? Any other guesses? Do you think it'll be very likely? No. All right. So here's how you would think about and actually do this problem. Instead of saying at least two people have the same birthday, the opposite of that is what's the probability that nobody has the same birthday? That's what we're going to find first. So the probability that birthdays that are the same is zero. Here's how we go about it. All right. So pretend you have a room and it's empty. Mm -hmm. The first person comes in. What is the probability that their birthday is different than all the other people that were already in the room? I know that that's the hardest one. All right. They're the only person. All right. So now you have one person in a room. The second person walks into the room. What is the probability that their birthday is different than the other person in the room? And it has to be different because I want the likelihood that none of them have the same birthday. Well, if one person is in the room, how many possible options do they have to pick from if they want to be different? 364 out of 365. The third person walks into the room. How many birthday choices do they have? Three hundred and sixty three out of three sixty five. And then three sixty two out of three sixty five. And then three sixty one out of three sixty five. And I gotta do this twenty times. Here's what we actually find out. The numerator is a permutation. Three sixty five permutation twenty. My denominator is 365 20 times, so the 20th power. So now, someone with a graphing calculator, can you hand it to me? Thank you. Your calculator actually has permutation in there as a um, function. And I need to have 365 permutation. 20. So if you're wondering, this number in the numerator is 1.03 in a bunch of decimals times 10 to the 51st power. So 51, we just keep moving that decimal place to the right 51 times. That's a lot of ways to have a bunch of birthdays. But then I'm going to divide that by 365 to the 20th power. And this is 0.5886. Here's what that means. In a room with 20 people, there is a 58.86% chance that they all have different birthdays. What's the opposite of all of them being different? Someone is the same. So if I do 1 minus that number, the probability that at least two people have the same birthday, 41.14% chance. There is over a 40% chance that at least two people have the same birthday. And if I talk to people just in general and say, well, if I have a room of 30, I got a better than 50% chance that at least two people have the same birthday. They're like, no way. That's impossible. Impossible. I show them the math and whether or not they know the math. They still think it's impossible, but this is right. I'm telling you right now. 
that is accurate. So then you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. With me, there are 17 people in this room with the same birthday, or that with birthdays. So it's going to be a little bit lower probability than this, than the 41. But there is a reasonable chance that at least two of us have the same birthday. Sometimes probability is intuitive. Other times, when you start talking about more complicated ideas like this, not as intuitive. But the fact that these follow this pattern, 36 times 34, 360, 362, 361. We did that at the beginning, right? We're like, oh, when there's three, it was like eight times seven times six when there are eight people in a room. Now there's 20 people in a room, but it's 365 choices to choose from to get us here. All right, so today represents the last day of new content. On Tuesday next week, we'll begin looking at the review questions I set out to you. You'll need to have worked on them ahead of time or your time will be wasted. If all you're going to come do is just watch me work through problems, that's wasting your time practicing on your own is going to yield results towards getting to the exam and being successful. If success is not your desire, then do it however you wish. Until then.